The True Story of Ah Hu Chapter 1 Introduction I have been meaning to write the true story of Ah Hu for several years now. But while wanting to write, I had some trepidations too, which goes to show that I am not one of those who achieve glory by writing. For an immortal pen has always been required to record the deeds of an immortal man. The man becoming known to posterity through the writing and the writing known to posterity through the man. Until finally it is not clear who is making whom known, but in the end as though possessed by some fiend, I always came back to the idea of writing the story of R.Q. And yet, no sooner had I taken up my pen that I became conscious of huge difficulties in writing this far from immortal work. The first was the question of what to call it. Confucius said, if the name is not correct, the words will not ring true. And this axiom should be most scrupulously observed. There are many types of biographies, official biographies, autobiographies, unauthorized biographies, legends, supplementary biographies, family histories, sketches. But unfortunately, none of these suited my purpose. Official biography. This account will obviously not be included with those of many eminent people in some authentic history. Autobiography, but I am obviously not RQ. If I were to call this an unauthorized biography, then where is his authenticated biography? The use of legend is impossible because RQ was no legendary figure. Supplementary biography, but no president has ever ordered the National Historic Institute to write a standard life of RQ. It is true that although there are no lives of gamblers in authentic English history, the famous author Conan Doyle nevertheless wrote Rodney Stone. But while this is permissible for a famous author, it is not perm permissible for such as I. Then there is family history, but I do not know whether I belong to the same family as Ahakyu or not nor have I ever been entrusted with such a task by his children or grandchildren. If I were to use sketch, it might be objected that R.Q. had no complete account. In short, this is really a life. But since I write in vulgar vein using the language of hucksters and peddlers, I dare not presume to give it so high sounding a title. So, from a stock phrase of the novelist, who are not reckoned among the three cults of nine schools, enough of this digression and back to the true story. I will take the last two words as my title, and if this is reminiscent of the true story of calligraphy of the ancients, it cannot be helped. The second difficulty confronting me was that a biography of this type should start off something like this. So and so, whose other name was so and so, was a native of such a such place. But I don't really know what RQ's surname was. Once he seemed to be named Chow, but the next day there was some confusion about the matter again. This was after Mr. Chow's son had passed the country examination and his success was being announced in the village to the sounding of gongs. R.Q., who had just drunk two bowls of yellow wine, began to prance about declaring that this reflected credit on him too. Since he belonged to the same clan as Mr. Chow, and by an exact reckoning was three generations senior to the successful candidate, at the time, several of the bystanders even began to stand slightly in awe of him, 
but the next day the bailiff summoned Ah Kyu to Mr. Chow's house. When the old gentleman set eyes on him, his face turned crimson with fury and he roared. Ah Kyu, you miserable wretch! Did you say I belong to the same clan as you? Ah Kyu made no reply. The more he looked at him, the angrier Mr. Chow became. And advancing menacingly a few steps, he said, "How dare you talk such nonsense? How could I have such a relative as you? Is your surname Chow?" Ah Kyu made no reply and was planning a retreat, but Mr. Chow darted forward and gave him a slap on the face. How could you be named Chow? Do you think you are worthy of the name Chow? Ah Kyu made no attempt to defend his right to the name Chow, but rubbing his left cheek, went out with the bailiff. Once outside, he had to listen to another torrent of abuse from the bailiff, and thank him to the tune of two hundred cash. All who heard of this said Ah Kyu was a great fool to ask for a beating like that. Even if his surname were Chow, which wasn't likely, he should have known better than to boast like that when there was a Mr. Chow living in the village. After this, no further mention was made of Ah Kyu's ancestry, so that I still don't know what his surname was really. The third difficulty I encountered in writing this work was that I don't know how Arkew's personal name should be written either. During his lifetime, everybody called him Ah Chui, but after his death, not a soul mentioned Ah Chu. Again, for he was obviously not one of those whose name is preserved on bamboo tablets and silk. If there is any question of preserving his name, this essay must be the first attempt at doing so. Hence, I am confronted with this difficulty at the outset. I have given the question careful thought. Ah Chu, would that be the Chu, meaning Kesia, or the Chu, meaning nobility? If his other name had been Moon Pavilion, or if he had celebrated his birthday in the month of the Moon Festival, then it would certainly be the Chu for Caesia. But since he had no other name, or if he had, no one knew it. And since he never sent out invitations on his birthday to secure complimentary verses, it would be arbitrary to write Ah Chu again if he had had an. Elder or younger brother called Ah Fu. This prosperity, then he would certainly be called Ah Chu, nobility. But he was all on his own. Thus, there is no evidence for writing Ah Chu, nobility. All the other unusual characters with the sound Chu are even less suitable. I once put this question to Mr. Chow's son. The successful country county candidate, but even such a learned man as he was, baffled by it. According to him, however, the reason that this name could not be traced was that Chan Chu Xia had bought out the magazine New Youth, advocating the use of the Western alphabet, so that the national culture was going to the dogs. As a last resort, I asked someone from my district to go and look up the legal documents regarding Ah Kyu's case. But after eight months, he sent me a letter saying that there was no name anything like Ah Chu in those records. Although uncertain whether this was the truth or whether my friend had simply done nothing, after failing to trace the name this way, I could think of no other means of finding it. Since I am afraid the new system of phonetics has not yet come into com common use, there is nothing for it but to use the Western alphabet. Writing the name according to the English spelling as Ah Chu and abbreviating it to Ah Q, 
This approximates to blindly following the new youth magazine and I am thoroughly ashamed of myself. But since even such a learned man as Mr. Chao's son could not solve my problem, what else can I do? My fourth difficulty was with RQ's place of origin. If his surname was Chao, then according to the old custom, which still prevails of classifying people by their districts, one might look up the commentary in the hundred surnames and find a native of Tian Shui in Kansu province. But unfortunately, this surname is open to question. With the result that RQ's place of origin must also remain uncertain. Although he lived for the most part in Wei Chung, he often stayed in other places so that it would be wrong to call him a native of Wei Chung. It would in fact amount to a distortion of history. The only thing that consoles me is the fact that the character R is absolutely correct. This is definitely not the result of false analogy and is well able to stand the test of scholarly criticism. As for the other problems, it is not for such unlearned people as myself to solve them. And I can only hope that disciples of Dr. Hu Shi, who has such a passion for history and antiquities, may be able in future to throw new light on them. I am afraid, however, that by the time my true story of RQ will have long since passed into oblivion. The foregoing may be considered as an introduction. Chapter 2 a brief account of RQ's victories. In addition to the uncertainty regarding RQ's surname, personal name and place of origin, there is even some uncertainty regarding his background. This is because the people of Wei Chung only made use of his services or treated him as a laughing stock without ever paying the slightest attention to his background. Ahakyu himself remained silent on this subject, except that when quarreling with someone, he might glance at him and say, We used to be much better off than you. Who do you think you are anyway? Ahakyu had no family but lived in the tutelary god's temple at Wei Chung. He had no regular work either, simply doing odd jobs for others. If there was wheat to be cut, he would cut it. If there was rice to be ground, he would grind it. If there was a boat to be punted, he would punt it. If the work lasted for a considerable period, he might stay in the house of his temporary employer. But as soon as it was finished, he would leave. Thus, whenever people had work to be done, they would remember RQ. But... What they remembered was his service and not his background. And by the time the job was done, even RQ himself would be forgotten, to say nothing of his background. Once, indeed, an old man remarked, what a good worker RQ is. At that time, RQ, stripped to the waist, listless and lean, was standing before him and other people did not know whether the remark was meant seriously or derisively, but RQ was overjoyed. RQ again had a very high opinion of himself. He looked down on all the inhabitants of Wei Chung, thinking even the two young scholars not worth a smile. Though most young scholars were likely to pass the official examination, Mr. Chao and Mr. Qin were held in great respect by the villagers. For in addition to being rich, they were both the fathers of young scholars. RQ alone showed them no exceptional deference, thinking to himself, My sons may be much greater. Moreover, after RQ had been to town several times, he naturally became even more conceited. 
although at the same time he had the greatest contempt for townspeople. For instance, a bench made of a wooden plank three feet by three inches, the Weichung villagers called a long bench. Ah called it a long bench too, but the townspeople called it a straight bench and he thought, this is wrong, how ridiculous. Again, when they fried large-headed fish in oil, the Weichung villagers all added shallot leaves sliced half an inch long. Whereas the townspeople added finely shredded shallots, and he thought this is wrong too, how ridiculous. But the Weichung villagers were really ignorant rustics who had never seen the fried fish of the town. Ah who used to be much better off, who was a man of the word and a good worker, would have been almost the perfect man had it not been for a few unfortunate physical blemishes. The most annoying consisted of some places on his scalp where in the past, at some uncertain date, shiny ringworm scars had appeared. Although these were on his own head, apparently, RQ did not consider them as altogether honourable, for he refrained from using the word ringworm, or any words that sounded anything like it. Later, he improved on this, making bright and light forbidden words, while later still, even lamp and candle were taboo. Whenever this taboo was disregarded, whether intentionally or not, RQ would fly into a rage, his ringworm scars turning scarlet. He would look over the offender, and if it were someone weak in raparch, he would curse him, while if it were a poor fighter, he would hit him. And yet, curiously enough, it was usually RQ who was worsted in these encounters. Until finally he adopted new tactics, contenting himself in general with a furious glare. It so happened, however, that after RQ had taken to using this furious glare, the idlers in Weichung grew even more fond of making jokes at his expense. As soon as they saw him, they would pretend to give, in, give a start and say, Look, it's lighting up. RQ would rise to the bait as usual and glare furiously. So there is a kerosene lamp here, they would continue, not in the least intimidated. RQ could do nothing but rack his brains for some retort. You don't even deserve. At this juncture, it seemed as if the scars on his scalp were noble and honorable, not just ordinary ringworm scars. However, as we said above, RQ was a man of the word. He knew at once that he had nearly broken the taboo and refrained from saying any more. If the idlers were still not satisfied but continued to bait him, they would in the end come to blows. Then only after RQ had, to all appearances, been defeated, had his brownish pigtail pulled and his head bumped against the wall four or five times. Would the idlers walk away, satisfied at having won? RQ would stand there for a second, thinking to himself, It is as if I were beaten by my son. What is the word coming to nowadays? Thereupon he too would walk away, satisfied at having won. Whatever RQ thought, he was sure to tell people later. Thus, almost all who made fun of RQ knew that he had this means of winning a psychological victory. So after this, anyone who pulled or twisted his brown pigtail would forestall him by saying, RQ, this is not a son beating his father. It's a man beating a beast. Let's hear your, you say it, a man beating a beast. Then RQ, clutching at the root of his pigtail, his head on one side would say, Beating an insect, how about that? 
I am an insect. Now will you let me go? But although he was an insect, the idlers would not let him go until they had knocked his head five or six times against something nearby, according to their custom. After which they would walk away satisfied that they had won, confident that this time RQ was done for. In less than 10 seconds, however, RQ would walk away, also satisfied that he had won thinking that he was the foremost self-belittler and that after subtracting self-belittler, what remained was foremost. Was not the highest successful candidate in the official examination also the foremost? And who do you think you are anyway? After employing such cunning devices to get even with his enemies, RQ would make his way cheerfully to the wine shop to drink a few bowls of wine. Joke with the others again, quarrel with them again, come off victorious again and return cheerfully to the tutelary god's temple, there to fall asleep as soon as his head touched the pillow. If he had money, he would go to gamble. There would be a group of men squatting on the ground. RQ sandwiched in the midst, his face streaming with perspiration, and his voice would be the loudest to shout. 400 on the green dragon. Hey, open there. The stakeholder, his face steaming with perspiration too, would open the box and chant. Heavenly gate, nothing for the corner, no stakes on the popularity passage. Pass over RQ's coppers. The passage, 100, 150. To the tune of this chanting, RQ's money would gradually vanish into the pockets of others, perspiring people. Finally, he would be forced to squeeze his way out of the crowd and watch from the back taking a vic vicarious interest in the game until it broke up. When he would return reluctantly to the tutelary god's temple, and the next day he would go to work with swollen eyes. However, the truth of the proverb, misfortune may be a blessing in disguise, was shown when RQ was unfortunate enough to win and almost suffered defeat in the end. This was the evening of the festival of the gods in Wei Chung. According to custom, there was a play and close to the stage, also according to custom, were numerous gambling tables. The drums and gongs of the place sounded about three miles away to RQ, who had ears only for the stakeholders chant. He staked successfully again and again, his coppers turning into silver coins, his silver coins into dollars and his dollars mounting up. In his excitement he cried out, two dollars on heavenly gate. He never knew who started the fighting, nor for what reason. Curses, blows and footsteps formed a confused medley of sound in his head. And by the time he clambered to his feet, the gambling tables had vanished, and so had the gamblers. Several parts of his body seemed to be aching as if he had been kicked and knocked about, while a number of people were looking at him in astonishment. Feeling as if there was something amiss, he walked back to the tutelary god's temple. And by the time he regained his composure, he realized that his pile of dollars has disappeared. Since most of the people who ran gambling tables at the festival were not natives of Wai Chung, where could he look for the culprits? So white and glittering a pile of silver, it has all been his, but now it had disappeared. Even to consider it tenth amount to being robbed by his son could not confer, conf, comfort him. To consider himself as an insect could not comfort him either. This time he really tasted something of the bitterness of defeat. 
but presently he changed defeat into victory. Raising his right hand, he slapped his own face hard twice, so that it tingled with pain. After this slapping, his heart felt lighter, for it seemed as if the one who had given the slap was himself. The one slapped some other self, and soon it was just as if he had beaten someone else. In spite of the fact that his face was still tingling, he lay down satisfied that he had gained the victory. Soon he was asleep. Chapter 3 a further account of Arcu's victories. Although Arcu was always gaining victories, it was only after he was favored with a slap on the face by Mr. Chow that he became famous. After paying the bailiff 200 cash, he lay down angrily. Later, he said to himself, What is the word coming to nowadays? With sons beating their parents. Then the thought of the prestige of Mr. Chow, who was now his son, gradually raised his spirits and he got up and went to the wine shop, singing the young widow at her husband's grave. At that time he did feel that Mr. Chow was a cut above the most people. After this incident, strange to relate, it was true that everybody seemed to pay him unusual respect. He probably attributed this to the fact that he was Mr. Chow's father, but actually such was not the case. In Wai Chung, as a rule, if the seventh child hit the eighth child, or Li so and so hit Chung so and so, it was not taken seriously. A beating had to be connected with some important personage like Mr. Chow before the villagers thought it worth talking about. But once they thought it worth talking about, since the beater was famous, the one beaten enjoyed some of his reflected fame. As for the fault being accused, that was naturally taken for granted. The reason being that Mr. Chow could not possibly be wrong. But if RQ were wrong, why did everybody seem to treat him with unusual respect? This is difficult to explain. We may put forward the hypothesis that it was because RQ had said he belonged to the same family as Mr. Chow. Thus, although he had been beaten, people were still afraid there might be some truth in what he said and therefore thought it safer to treat him more respectfully. Or alternatively, it may have been like the case of the sacrificial beef in the Confucian temple. Although the beef was in the same category as the sacrificial pork and mutton, being of animal origin, just as they were. Later Confucians did not dare touch it, since the sage has enjoyed it. After this, RQ prospers, prospered for several years. One spring, when he was walking alone in a state of happy intoxication, he saw Whiskers Wang sitting stripped to the waist in the sunlight at the foot of a wall, catching lice, and at this sight his own body began to itch. Since Whiskers Wang was scabby and bee-whiskered, everybody called him Ringworm Whiskers Wang. Although RQ omitted the word ringworm, he had the greatest contempt for him. RQ felt that while scabs were nothing to take exception to, such hairy cheeks were really too outlandish and could excite nothing but scorn. So RQ sat down by his side. If it had been any other idler, RQ would never have dared sit down so casually. But what had he to fear by the side of Whiskers Wong? 
To tell the truth, the fact that he was willing to sit down was an honor for Wang. Ah Q took his took off his tattered lined jacket and turned it inside out. But either because he had washed it recently or because he was too clumsy, a long search yielded only three or four lies. He saw that Whiskers Wong, on the other hand, was catching first one and then another in swift succession, cracking them in his mouth with a popping sound. RQ felt first disappointed and then resentful that despicable Whiskers Wong could catch so many while he himself had caught so few. What a great loss of face! He longed to catch one or two big ones, but there were none, and it was only with considerable difficulty that he managed to catch a middle-sized one, which he thrust fiercely into his mouth a bit savagely, but it only gave a small sputtering sound, again inferior to the noise Whiskers Wong was making. All Arcu's scars turned scarlet. Flinging his jacket on the ground, he spat and said, Harry Wong, Mangy Dog, who are you calling names? Whisker Wong looked up contemptuously. Although the relative respect accorded him in recent years had increased, Arcu's pride, when confronted by loafers who were accustomed to fighting, remained rather timid. On this occasion, however, he was feeling exceptionally pugnacious. How dare a hairy-cheeked creature like this insult him? Anyone who the name fits, said Argue, standing up, his hands on his hips. Are, you bones, are your bones itching? demanded Whiskers Wong, standing up too and putting on his coat. Thinking that Wong meant to run away, Ah stepped forward, raising his fist to punch him. But before his fist came down, Whisker Wong had already seized him and given him a tug, which sent him staggering. Then Whisker Wong seized Ah pigtail and started dragging him towards the wall to knock his head in a time-honored manner. A gentleman uses his tongue, but not his hand, protested RQ, his head on one side. Apparently, Whiskers Wong was no gentleman, for without paying the slightest attention to what RQ said, he knocked his head against the wall five times in succession and gave him a great show, which sent him staggering two yards away. Only then did Whiskers Wong walk away satisfied. As far as RQ could remember, this was the first humiliation of his life because he had always scoffed at Whiskers Wong on account of his ugly whiskered cheeks, but had never been scoffed at, much less beaten by him. And now, contrary to all expectations, Whisker Wong had beaten him. Perhaps what they said in the marketplace was really true. The emperor had abolished the official examinations, so that scholars who have passed them are no longer in demand. As a result of this, the Zhao family must have lost prestige. Was it a result of this, too, that people were treating him contemptuously? Ah stood there irresolutely. From the distance approached another of RQ's enemies. This was Mr. Chien's eldest son, whom RQ also despised. After studying in a foreign school in the city, it seemed he had gone to Japan. When he came home half a year later, his legs were straight and his pigtails had disappeared. His mother cried bitterly a dozen times, and his wife tried three times to jump into the well. Later his mother told everyone, 
His pigtail was cut off by some scoundrel when he was drunk. He would have been able to be an official, but now he will have to wait until it has grown again before he thinks of that. RQ did not, however, believe this and insisted on calling him imitation foreign devil and traitor in foreign pay. As soon as he saw him, he would start cursing under his breath. What RQ despised and detested most in him was his false pigtail. When it came to having a false pigtail, a man could scarcely be considered as human, and the fact that his wife had not attempted to jump into a well for time showed that she was not a good woman either. Now this imitation foreign devil was approaching, bald head as in the past RQ had cursed under his breath only, inaudibly, but today because he was in a bad temper and wanted to work off his feelings, the words slipped out involuntarily. Unfortunately, this bald head was carrying a shiny brown stick which RQ called a staff carried by the mourner. With great strides, he bore down on RQ, who, guessing at once that a beating was impending, hastily braced himself to wait with a stiffened back. Sure enough, there was a resounding talk which seemed to have alighted on his head. I meant him, explained RQ, pointing to a nearby child. Talk, talk, talk. As far as RQ could remember, this was the second humiliation of his life. Fortunately, after the talking stopped, it seemed to him that the matter was closed, and he even felt somehow relieved. Moreover, the precious ability to forget, handed down by his ancestors, stood him in good stead. He walked slowly away, and by the time he was approaching the wine shop door, he felt quite happy again. Just then, however, a small nun from the convent of quiet self-improvement came walking towards him. The sight of a nun always made RQ swear, how much more so than after his humiliations. When he recalled what has happened, all his anger revived. So all my bad luck today was because I had to see you, he thought to himself. He went up to her and spat noisily. Ah, uh, bah! The small nun paid not the least attention, but walked on with lowered head. RQ went up to her and shot out a hand to rub her newly shaved scalp, then laughing stupidly said, Bald head, go back quickly. Your monk is waiting for you. Who are you pawing? demanded the nun, blushing crimson as he began to hurry away. The man in the wine shop roared with laughter, seeing that his feet was admired. RQ began to feel elated. If the monk paws you, why can't I? said he, pinching her cheek. Again the men in the wine shop roared with laughter. RQ felt even more pleased and in order to satisfy those who were expressing approval, he pinched her hard again before letting her go. During this encounter he had already forgotten Whiskers Wong and the imitation foreign devil, as if all the day's bad luck had been avenged, and strange to relate, even more relaxed than after the beating. He felt light and buoyant, as if ready to float into the air. Ark you, may you die sunless, sounded the little nun's voice tearfully in the distance. Ark you roared with delighted laughter. The men in the wine shop roared too, with only slightly less satisfaction. Chapter 6 From Restoration to Decline Wei Chung did not see RQ again till just after the moon festival that year. Everybody was surprised to hear of his return and this made them think back and wonder 
where he had been all this time. The few previous occasions on which RQ had been to town, he had usually informed people in advance with great gusto. But since he had not done so this time, no one had not noticed his going. He might have told the old man in charge of the tutelary god's temple. But according to the custom of Wei Chung, it was only when Mr. Chao, Mr. Chin or the successful county candidate went to town that it was considered important. Even the imitations foreign devils going was not talked about, much less argues. This would explain why the old man had not spread the news for him with the result that the villagers had had no means of knowing it. But Arcu's return this time was very different from before and in fact quite enough to occasion astonishment. The day was growing dark when he appeared blinking sleepily before the door of the wine shop, walked up to the counter, pulled a handful of silver and coppers from his belt and tossed him to the counter. Cash, he said, bring the wine. He was wearing a new lined jacket and evidently a large purse hung at his waist, the great weight of which caused his belt to sag in a sharp curve. It was the custom in Wei Chung that when there seemed to be something unusual about anyone, he should be treated with respect rather than insolence. And now, although they knew quite well that this was RQ, still he was very different from the RQ of the ragged court. The ancients say, a scholar who has been away three days must be looked at with new eyes. And so the waiter, innkeeper, customers and passerbys all quite naturally expressed a kind of suspicion mingled with respect. The innkeeper started by nodding, then said, Hello, RQ, so you are back? Yes, I am back. You have made money, uh, where? I went to town. By the next day, this piece of news had spread through Wei Chung, and since everybody wanted to hear the success story of this RQ, of the ready money and the new line jacket in the wine shop, tea house and under the temple eaves, the villagers gradually ferreted out the news. The result was that they began to treat RQ with a new deference. According to RQ, he had been a servant in the house of a successful provincial candidate. This part of the story filled all who heard it with awe. This successful provincial candidate was named Pai. But because he was the only successful provincial candidate in the whole town, there was no need to use his surname. Whenever anyone spoke of the successful provincial candidate, it meant him. And this was so not only in Waichung, but everywhere within a radius of 30 miles. As if everybody imagined his name to be Mr. Successful Provincial Candidate. To have worked in the household of such a man naturally called for respect. But according to RQ's further statements, he was unwilling to go on working there because this successful candidate was really too much of a turtle's egg. This part of the story made all who heard it sigh, but with a sense of pleasure, because it showed that RQ was actually not fit to work in such a man's household. Yet, not to work was a pity. According to RQ, his return was also due to the fact that he was not satisfied with the townspeople because they called a long bench a straight bench. Used shredded shallots to fry fish and a defect he had recently discovered. The women did not sway in a very satisfactory manner as they walked. However, the town had its good point too. For instance, in Weichung, everyone played with 32 bamboo counters and only the imitation foreign devil could play Ma Chong. But in town, even the street urchins excelled at Ma Chong. You had only to place the imitation foreign devil in the hands of these young rascals in their teens. 
for him straight away to become like a small devil before the king of hell. This part of the story made all who heard it blush. Have you seen an execution? asked R.Q. Ah, oh, that's a fine sight. When they execute the revolutionaries, ah, oh, that's a fine sight, a fine sight. As he shook his head, his spittle flew onto the face of Chao Su Chan, directly opposite. This part of the story made all who heard it tremble. Then, with a glance around, he suddenly raised his right hand and dropped it on the neck of Whiskers Wong, who was listening rapidly with his head thrust forward. Kill! shouted Aq. Whiskers Wong gave a start and drew in his head as fast as lightning or a spark struck from a flint, while the bystanders shivered with pleasurable apprehension. After this, Whiskers Wong went about in a daze for many days and dared not go near Aq nor did the others. Although we cannot say Aq's status in the eyes of the inhabitants of Wai Chung at this time was superior to that of Mr. Chao, we can at least affirm without any danger of inaccuracy that it was about the same. Not long after, Aq's fame suddenly spread into the women's apartments of Wai Chung too. Although the only two families of any pretensions in Wai Chung were those of Qin and Chao, and nine-tenths of the rest were poor. Still, women's apartments are women's apartments, and this spreading of Aq's fame into them was something of a miracle. When the women folk met, they would say to each other, Mrs. Sao bought a blue silk skirt from Aq. Although it was old, still it only cost 90 cents, and Chao Pai Yen's mother bought a child's costume of crimson foreign celio, which was nearly new, only spending 300 cash, less 8% discount. Then those who had no silk skirt or needed foreign keliso were most anxious to see RQ in order to buy from him. Far from avoiding him now, they would sometimes follow him when he passed, calling to him to stop. Ask you, have you any more silk skirts? They would ask. No, we want foreign salio too. Do you have any? This news later spread from the poor households to the rich ones, because Mrs. Sao was so pleased with her silk skirt that she took it to Mr. Mrs. Chow for her approval. And Mrs. Chow told Mr. Chow, speaking very highly of it. Mr. Chow discussed the matter that evening at dinner with his son, the successful county candidate, suggesting that there must be something queer about RQ and that they should be more careful about their doors and windows. They did not know though whether RQ had anything left or not, and though he might still have something good. And Mrs. Chow happened to be wanting a good cheap fur vest. So after a family council, it was decided to ask Mrs. Sao to find RQ for them at once. And for this, a third exception was made to the rule. Special permission being given for a lamp to be lit that evening. A considerable amount of oil had been burned, but still there were no signs of RQ. The whole Chao household was yawning with impatience, some of them resenting RQ's indisciplined ways, some of them angrily blaming Mrs. Sao for not trying harder to get him there. Mrs. Chao was afraid that RQ dared not come because of the terms agreed upon that spring. But Mrs. Chao did not think this anything to worry about. Because, as he said, this time I sent for him. And sure enough, Mrs. Mr. Chao proved himself a man of insight, for RQ finally arrived with Mrs. Sao. He keeps saying that he has nothing left, panted Mrs. Sao as she came in. When I told him to come and tend you so himself, he would go on talking. I told him, Sir, said RQ with an attempt at a smile, coming to a halt under the eaves. I hear you got rich out there, RQ, said Mr. Chow, 
going up to him and looking him carefully over. Very good. Now, they say you have some old things. Bring them all here for us to have a look at. This is simply because I happen to want... I told Mrs. Sao there is nothing left. Nothing left? Mr. Chao could not help sounding disappointed. How could they go so quickly? They belonged to a friend and there was not much to begin with. People bought some. There must be something left. Now there is only a door curtain left. Then bring the door curtain for us to see, said Mrs. Chow hurriedly. Well, it would be all right if you bring it tomorrow, said Mr. Chow without much enthusiasm. When you have anything in future, argue, you must bring it to us first. We certainly will not pay less than other people, said the successful county candidate. His wife shot a hasty glance to argue to see his reaction. I need a fur vest, said Mrs. Chow. Although RQ agreed, he slouched out so carelessly that they did not know whether he had taken their instructions to heart or not. This made Mr. Chow so disappointed, annoyed and worried that he even stopped yawning. The successful candidate was also far from satisfied with RQ's attitude and said, People should be on their guard against such a turtle's egg. It might be best to order the bailiff not to allow him to live in Wei Chung. But Mr. Chow did not agree, saying that he might be a grudge and that in a business like his, it was a probably a case of the eagle does not prey on its own nest. His own village need not worry and they need only be a little more watchful at night. The successful candidate was much impressed by his, this parental instruction and immediately withdrew his proposal for driving Argue away. Cautioning Mrs. Sao on no account to repeat what he had said. The next day, however, when Mrs. Sao took her blue skirt to be dyed black, she repeated these instructions, insinuations about Argue, although not actually mentioning what was successful candidate had said about driving him away. But even so, it was most damaging to argue. In the first place, the bailiff appeared at his door and took away the door curtain. Although argue protested that Mrs. Chow wanted to see it, the bailiff would not give it back and even demanded a monthly payment of harsh money. In the second place, the villagers' respect for him suddenly changed. Although they still dared not take liberties, they avoided him as much as possible. And while this differed from their previous fear of his skill, it closely resembled the attitude of the ancients to spirits, keeping a respectful distance. But there were some idlers who wanted to get to the bottom of the business, who went to question RQ carefully and with no attempt at concealment, RQ told them proudly of his experiences. They learned that he had merely been a petty thief, not only unable to climb walls but even unable to go through openings. He simply stood outside an opening to receive the stolen goods. One night he had just received a package and his chief had gone in again, when he heard a great uproar inside and took to his heels as far as he could, as fast as he could. He fled from the town that same night back to Wei Chung, and after this he dared not return to that business. This story, however, was even more damaging to argue, since the villagers had been keeping a respectful distance because they did not want to incur his enmity. For who could have guessed that he was only a thief who dared not steal again. But now they knew he was really too low to inspire fear. Chapter 7 The Revolution On the 14th day of the ninth moon of the third year in the reign of Emperor Sun Tung, the day on which Akyu sold his purse to Chao Pai Yan, at midnight, after the fourth stroke of the third watch, a large boat with a big black awning came to the Chao family's landing place. 
This boat floated up in the darkness while the villagers were sound asleep, so that they knew nothing about it. But it left again. About dawn, when quite a number of people saw it, Investigations revealed that this boat actually belonged to the successful provincial candidate. This boat caused great uneasiness in Waichung, and before midday the herds of all the villagers were beating faster. The Chao family kept very quiet about the errand of the boat, but according to the gossip in the tea house and wine shop, the revolutionaries were going to enter the town and the successful provincial candidate had come to the country to take refuge. Mrs. Sao alone thought otherwise, maintaining that the successful provincial candidate had merely wanted to deposit a few battered cases in Wei Chung. But Mr. Chao had sent them back. Actually, the successful provincial candidate and the successful County candidate in the Chao family were not on good terms, so that it was scarcely logical to expect them to prove friends in adversity. Moreover, since Mrs. Sao was a neighbor of the Chao family and had a better idea of what was going on, she ought to have known. Then a rumor spread to the effect that although the scholar had not arrived himself, he had sent a long letter tracing some distant relationship with the Chao family. And Mr. Chao, after thinking it over, had decided it could, after all, do him no harm to keep the cases. So they were now stowed under his wife's bed. As for the revolutionaries, some people said they had entered the town that night in white helmets and white armor. The morning dress for Emperor Sung Chang. Ah had long since heard of the revolutionaries and this year had, with his own eyes, seen revolutionaries being de decapitated. But since it had occurred to him that the revolutionaries were rebels and that a rebellion would make things difficult for him, he had always detested and kept away from them. Who could have guessed they could so frighten a successful provincial candidate? renowned for 30 miles around. In consequence, RQ could not help feeling rather entranced, the terror of all the villagers only adding to his delight. Revolution is not a bad thing, thought RQ. Finish off the whole lot of them, curse them. I would like to go over to the revolutionaries myself. RQ had been hard up recently and was probably rather dissatisfied. Added to this was the fact that he had drunk two bowls of wine at noon on an empty stomach. Consequently, he got drunk more quickly than ever, and as he walked along, along thinking to himself, he felt again as if he were treading on air. Suddenly, in some curious way, he felt as if the revolutionaries were himself and all the people in Waichum were his captives. Unable to contain himself for joy, he could not help shouting loudly, Rebellion! Rebellion! All the villagers looked at him in consternation. RQ had never seen such pitiful looks before and found them as refreshing as a drink of iced water in midsummer. So he walked on even more happily, shouting, All right, I shall take what I want. I shall like whom I please. Tra la, tra la. I regret to have killed by mistake my sworn brother Chung in my cups. I regret to have killed. Ya, ya, ya. Tra la, tra la. Tom, tom, tom. I'll thrash you with a steel maze. Mr. Chow and his son were standing at their gate with two relatives discussing the revolution. But RQ did not see them as he went past singing with his head thrown back. Tra la, tra la, thom, thom, thom. Q, old chap, called Mr. Chow timidly in a low voice. 
Tala sang Aku, unable to imagine that his name could be linked with those words, old chap. Sure that he had heard wrongly and was in no way concerned, he simply went on singing, Tala, Tala, Thom, Thom, Thom. Q, old chap, I regret to have killed. RQ, the successful candidate had to call his name. Only then did RQ come to a stop. Well, he asked with his head on one side. Q, old chap, now, but Mr. Chow was at a loss for words again. Are you getting rich now? Getting rich? Of course, I take what I like. RQ, old man, poor friends of yours like us can't possibly matter, said Chow Pai Yan apprehensively as if sounding out the revolutionary's attitude. Pure friends, surely you are richer than I am, said Argu and walked away. They stood there despondent and speechless. Then Mr. Chow and his son went back to the house and that evening discussed the question until it was time to light the lamps. When Chow Pai Yan went home, he took the purse from his waist and gave it to his wife to hide for him at the bottom of a chest. For some time, Argu seemed to be walking on air, but by the time he reached the tutelary god's temple, he was sober again. That evening, the old man in charge of the temple was also unexpectedly friendly and offered him tea. Then Argu asked him for two flat cakes, and after eating these demanded a four-ounce candle that had been used and a candlestick. He lit the candle and lay down alone in his little room. He felt inexpressibly refreshed and happy while the candlelight kept and flickered as on the lantern festival and his imagination too seemed to soar. Revolt, it would be fun. A group of revolutionaries would come, all wearing white helmets and white armor, carrying swords, steel, maces, bomb foreign guns, double-edged knives with sharp points, and spears with hooks. They would come to the tutelary god's temple and call out, Ark you, come with us, come with us, and then I would go with them. Then all those villagers would be in a laughable plight, kneeling down and pleading, Ark you, spare our lives, but who would listen to them? The first to die would be young D and Mr. Chow, then the successful county candidate and the imitation foreign devil. But perhaps I would spare a few. I would once have spared Whiskers Wang, but now I don't even want him either. Thanks. I would go straight in and open the cases, silver, ingots, foreign coins, foreign calico jackets. First, I would move the successful county candidate's wife, Ning Po Bed, to the temple and also move in the Chien family tables and chairs, or else just use the Chow families. I would not lift a finger myself, but order Young D to move the things for me, and to look smart about it, unless he wanted a slap in the face. Chow Zhu Chan's younger sister is very ugly. In a few years, Mrs. Sao's daughter might be worth considering. The imitation foreign devil's wife is willing to sleep with the man, Without a pigtail, huh? She can't be a good woman. The successful county candidate's wife has scars on her eyelids. I have not seen Amavu for a long time and don't know where she is. What a pity, her feet are so big. Before RQ had reached a satisfactory conclusion, there was a sound of snoring. The four ounce candle had burned down only half an inch and its flickering red light lit up his open mouth. Ho ho! shouted RQ suddenly, raising his head and looking wildly around. But when he saw the four-ounce candle, he lay back and went to sleep again. The next morning he got up very late, and when he went out to the street, everything was the same as usual. He was still hungry. But though he raked his brains, he did not seem able to think of anything. Then suddenly an idea came to him, and he walked slowly off, until either by design or accident, 
he reached a convent of quiet self-improvement. The convent was as peaceful as it had been that spring, with its white walls and shining black gate. After a moment's reflection, he knocked at the gate, whereupon a dog started barking within. He hastily picked up several pieces of broken bricks, then went up again to knock more heavily, knocking until a number of small dents appeared on the black gate, and at last he heard someone coming to open the door. Arq hastily got ready his broken bricks and stood with his legs wide apart, prepared to do battle with the white black dog. But the convent door op only opened a crack, and no black dog rushed out. When he looked and all he could see was the old nun. What are you here for again? she asked, giving a start. There is a revolution, did you know? said Arq vaguely. Revolution, revolution. There has already been one, said the old nun, her eyes red from crying. What do you think will become of us with all your revolutions? What? asked Argue in astonishment. Didn't you know the revolutionaries have already been here? Who? asked Argue in an even greater astonishment. The successful county candidate and the imitation foreign devil. This came as a complete surprise to argue who could not help being taken aback. When the old nun saw that he had lost his aggressiveness, she quickly shut the gate, so that when argue pushed it again, he could not budge it, and when he knocked again, there was no answer. It had happened that morning. The successful county candidate in the Chow family got news quickly. And as soon as he heard that the revolutionaries had entered the town that night, he had immediately wound his pigtail up on his head and gone out first thing to call on the imitation foreign devil in the Chian family, with whom he had never been on good terms. This was a time for all to work for reforms, so that so they had a very pleasant talk and became on the spot comrades who saw eye to eye and pledged themselves to become revolutionaries. After raking their brains for some time, they remembered that in the convent of quiet self-improvement was an imperial tablet inscribed, Long live the emperor, which ought to be done away with at once. Thereupon they lost no time in going to the convent to carry out their revolutionary activities. Because the old nun tried to stop them and put in a few words, they considered her as the Manchu garment and knocked her many times on the head with a stick and with their knuckles. The nun, pulling herself together after they had gone, made an inspection. Naturally, the imperial tablet had been smashed into fragments on the ground, but the valuable Sun Si Sansar before the shrine of Kuan Yin the goddess of mercy had also disappeared. Argue only learned this later. He deeply regretted having been asleep at the time and resented the fact that they had not come to call him. But then he said to himself, Maybe they still don't know I have joined the revolutionaries. Chapter 8 Barred from the Revolution the people of Waichung became more reassured every day. From the news that was brought, they knew that although the revolutionaries had entered the town, their coming had not made a great deal of difference. The magistrate was still the highest official. It was only his title that had changed. And the successful provincial candidate also had some post. The Waichung villagers could not remember these names clearly, some kind of official post. While the head of the military was still the same old captain, the only cause for alarm was that there were also some bad revolutionaries making trouble, who had started cutting off people's pigtails the day after their arrival. It was said that the boatmen, seven pounds from the next village, had fallen into their clutches and that he no longer looked presentable. 
Still, the danger of this was not great because the Waichung villagers seldom went to town to begin with. And those who had been considering a trip to town at once changed their plans in order to avoid this risk. RQ had been thinking of going to town to look up his old friends. But as soon as he heard the news, he gave up the idea in resignation. It would be wrong, however, to say that there were no reforms in Chung. During the next few days, the number of people who coiled their pigtails on their heads gradually increased. And as has already been said, the first to do so was naturally the successful county candidate. The next were Chao Su Chan and Chao Pai Yan and after them RQ. If it had been summer, it would not have been considered strange if everybody had coiled their pigtails on their heads or tied them in knots. But this was late autumn. So that this autumn observance of a summer practice on the part of those who coiled their pigtails could be considered nothing short of a heroic decision. And as far as Wai Chung was concerned, it could not be said to have no connection with the reforms. When Chao Su Chan approached with the nape of his neck barred, people who saw him would say, Ah, here come a revolutionary. When RQ heard this, he was greatly impressed, although he had long since heard how the successful county candidate has coiled his pigtails on his head. It, ne it had never occurred to him to do the same. Only now, when he saw that Chao Shu Chan had followed suit, was he struck with the idea of doing the same himself and made up his mind to copy them. He used a bamboo chopstick to twist his pigtail up on his head and after hesitating for some time, eventually summoned up the courage to go out. As he walked along the street, people looked at him, but nobody said anything. RQ was very displeased at first and then he became very resentful. Recently, he had been losing his temper very easily. As a matter of fact, his life was no harder than before the revolution. People treated him politely and the shops no longer demanded payment in cash. Yet, RQ still felt dissatisfied. He thought since a revolution had taken place, it should involve more than this. And then he saw young D, and the sight made him his anger boil over. Young D had also coiled his pigtail on his head, and what was more, he had actually used a bamboo chopstick to do so too. RQ had never imagined that young D would also have the courage to do this. He certainly could not tolerate such a thing. Who was young D anyway? He was greatly tempted to seize him then and then, break his bamboo chopstick, let down his pigtail and slap his face several times into the bargain to punish him for forgetting his place and for his presumption in becoming a revolutionary. But in the end he let him off, simply fixing him with a furious glare, spitting and exclaiming, Pa! These last few days the only one to go to town was the imitation foreign devil. The successful county candidate in the Chao family had thought of using the deposited cases as a pretext to call on the successful provincial candidate. But the danger that he might have his pigtail cut off had made him defer his visit. He had written an extremely formal letter and asked the imitation foreign devil to take it to town. He had also asked the latter to introduce him to the Liberty Party. When the imitation foreign devil came back, he asked the successful county candidate for $4 after which the successful county candidate wore a silver peach on his chest. All the Weichung villagers were overawed and said that this was the badge of the Persimmon Oil Party, equivalent to the rank of a Han Lin. As a result, Mr. Chao's prestige had suddenly increased. 
far more so in fact that when his son first passed the official examination. Consequently, he started looking down on everyone else and when he saw RQ tended to ignore him a little. RQ was thoroughly discontented at finding himself always ignored, but as soon as he heard of this silver peach, he realized at once why he was left out in the cold. Simply to say that you had gone over what was not enough to make anyone a revolutionary, nor was it enough merely to wind your pigtail up on your head. The most important thing was to get into touch with the revolutionary party. In all his life he had known only two revolutionaries, one of whom had already lost his head in town, leaving only the imitation foreign devil. Unless he went at once to talk things over with the imitation foreign devil, there was no way left open to him. The front gate of the Chien house happened to be open and RQ crept timidly in. Once inside he gave a start for there he saw the imitation foreign devil standing in the middle of the courtyard dressed entirely in black, no doubt in foreign dress and also wearing a silver peach. In his hand he held the stick with which RQ was already acquainted to his cost and the foot or so of hair which he had grown again fell over his shoulders hanging disheveled like Saint Leo's. Standing erect before him were Chao, Pai Yen and three others. All of them listening with the utmost deference to what he was saying. RQ tiptoed inside and stood behind Chao Pai Yen, wanting to utter a greeting but not knowing what to say. Obviously, he could not call the man imitation foreign devil and neither foreigner nor revolutionary seemed suitable. Perhaps the best form of address would be Mr. Foreigner. But Mr. Foreigner had not seen him because with eyes raised he was talking most animatedly. I am so impulsive that when we met I kept saying old hung we should get on with it. But he always answered nay. That's a foreign word which you wouldn't understand, otherwise we should have succeeded long ago. This is an instance of how cautious he is. He asked me again and again to go to Hoopa, but I wouldn't agree. Who wants to work in a small district town? Uh, uh, RQ waited for him to pause and then screwed up his courage to speak. But for some reason or other, he still did not call him Mr. Foreigner. The four men who had been listening gave a start and turned to stare at RQ. Mr. Foreigner, too, caught sight of him for the first time. What? I clear out. I want to join. Get out, said Mr. Foreigner, lifting the mourner's stick. Then Chao Pai Yan and the others shouted, Mr. Chien tells you to get out, don't you hear? RQ put up his hand to protect his head and without knowing what he was doing, fled through the gate. But this time Mr. Foreigner did not give chase. After running more than 60 steps, RQ began to slow down. And now he began to feel most upset. Because if Mr. Foreigner would not allow him to be a revolutionary, there was no other way open to him. In future he could never hope to have men in white helmets and white armor coming to call him. All his ambition, aim, hope and future had been blasted at one stroke. The fact that people might spread the news and make him a laughing stock for the likes of Young D and Whiskers Wong was only a secondary consideration. Never before had he felt so flat. Even coiling his pigtail on his head now struck him as pointless and ridiculous. As a form of revenge, he was very tempted to let his pigtail down at once. But he did not do so. He wandered about till evening, when after drinking two bowls of wine on credit, he began to feel in better spirits, and saw again in his mind's eye fragmentary visions of white helmets and white armor. 
One day he loafed about until late at night, only when the wine shop was about to close did he start to stroll back to the tutelary god's temple. Bang! Bump! He suddenly heard an unusual sound, which could not have been firecrackers. R.Q. always liked excitement and enjoyed poking his nose into other people's business, so he went looking for the noise in the darkness. He seemed to hear footsteps ahead and was listening carefully when a man suddenly rushed out in front of him. As soon as R.Q. saw him, he turned and followed him as fast as he could. When that man turned, R.Q. turned too. And when after turning a corner that man stopped, R.Q. stopped too. He saw there was no one behind and that the man was young T. What's the matter? asked R.Q. resentfully. Chow, the Chow family have been robbed, panted young T. R.Q.'s heart went pit-a-pat. After telling him this, young T left. R.Q. ran on and then stopped two or three times. However, since he had once been in the business himself, he felt exceptionally courageous. Emerging from the street corner, he listened carefully and thought he could hear shouting. He also looked carefully and thought he could see a lot of men in white helmets and white armor, carrying off cases, carrying off furniture, even carrying off the Ningpo bed of the successful county candidate's wife. He could not, however, see them very clearly. He wanted to go nearer, but his feet were rooted to the ground. There was no moon that night and Wei Chung was very still in the pitch darkness, as quiet as in the peaceful days of the ancient emperor Fu Si. Ah Kyu stood there until he lost interest. Yet everything still seemed the same as before. In the distance were people moving to and fro, carrying things, carrying off cases, carrying off furniture, carrying off the Ningpo bed of the successful county candidate's wife. Carrying until he could hardly believe his own eyes, but he decided not to go nearer and went back to the temple. It was even darker in the tutelary god's temple. When he had closed the big gate, he groped his way into his room. And only after he had been laying down for some time did he feel calm enough to begin to think how this affected him. The men in white helmets and white armor had evidently arrived, but they had not come to call him. They had moved out a lot of things, but there was no share for him. This was all the fault of the imitation foreign devil, who had barred him from the rebellion. Otherwise, how could he have failed to have a share this time? The more R.Q. thought of it, the angrier he grew until he was in a towering rage. So no rebellion for me, only for you, eh? he exclaimed, nodding maliciously. Curse you, you imitation foreign devil. All right, be a rebel. A rebel is punished by having his head chopped off. I shall have to turn informer to see you carried into town to have your head cut off. You and all your family. Kill, kill. Chapter 9 The Grand Finale After the Chao family was robbed, most of the people in Weichung felt pleased yet fearful. And yet RQ and RQ was no exception. But four days later, RQ was suddenly dragged into town in the middle of the night. It happened to be a dark night when a squad of soldiers, a squad of militia, a squad of police and five secret servicemen made their way quietly to Wei Chung. An undercover of darkness surrounded the tutelary god's temple, posting a machine gun opposite the entrance. Yet RQ did not rush out. For a long time nothing stirred in the temple. The captain grew impatient and offered a reward of 20,000 cash. Only then did two militia men summon up courage to jump over the wall and enter. Then with cooperation from within, the others rushed in and dragged Ahakyu out. 
but not until he had been carried out of the temple to somewhere near the machine gun did he begin to sober up. It was already midday by the time they reached town and Arkew find himself carried to a dilapidated Yemen where, after taking five or six turnings, he was pushed into a small room. No sooner had he stumbled inside the room made of wooden bars forming a grating closed upon his heels. The rest of the room consisted of three blank walls and when he looked round carefully, he saw two other men in a corner of the room. Although RQ was feeling rather uneasy, he was by no means too depressed because the room where he slept in the tutelary god's temple was in no way superior to this. The two other men also seemed to be villagers. They gradually fell into conversation with him and one of them told him that the successful provincial candidate wanted to dun him for the rent owned by his grandfather. The other did not know why he was there. When they questioned RQ, he answered quite frankly, because I wanted to revolt. That afternoon, he was dragged out through the bar door and taken to a big hall, at the far end of which was sitting an old man with his head shaved clean. RQ first took him for a monk, but when he saw soldiers standing beneath and a dozen men in long coats on both sides, some with their heads clean shaved like this old man, and some with a foot or so of long hair hanging over their shoulders, like the imitation foreign devils, but all glaring at him furiously from grim faces, then he knew this man must be someone important. At once the joints of his knees relaxed of their own accord and he sank down. Stand up to speak, don't kneel, shouted all the men in the long coats. Although Arkew understood, he felt incapable of standing up. His body had involuntarily dropped to a squatting position and improving on it, he finally knelt down. Slave, exclaimed the long-coated men contemptuously. They did not insist on his getting up, however. Tell the truth and you will receive a lighter sentence, said the old man with the shaved head in a low but clear voice, fixing his eyes on RQ. I know everything already. When you have confessed, I'll let you go. Confess, repeated the long-coated men loudly. The fact is, I wanted to come, muttered RQ disjointly, after a moment's confused thinking. In that case, why didn't you come? asked the old man gently. The imitation foreign devil wouldn't let me in. Nonsense, it is too late to talk now. Where are your accomplices? What? The people who robbed the Chow family that night. They didn't come to call me. They moved the things away themselves. Mention of this made RQ indignant. Where did they go? When you have told me, I'll let you go, said the old man even more gently. I don't know. They didn't come to call me. Then at a sign from the old man, RQ was dragged again through the bar door. The next time that he was dragged out was the following morning. Everything was unchanged in the big hall. The old man with the clean-shaved head was still sitting there and RQ knelt down again as before. Have you anything else to say? asked the old man gently. RQ thought and decided there was nothing to say, so he answered nothing. Then a man in a long coat brought a sheet of paper and held a brush in front of RQ, which he wanted to thrust into his hand. RQ was now nearly frightened out of his wits because this was the first time in his life that his hand had ever come into contact with a writing brush. He was just wondering how to hold it when the man pointed out a place on the paper and told him to sign his name. I, I can't write, said RQ nervous and sham-faced holding the brush. In that case, to make it easy for you, draw a circle. 
RQ tried to draw a circle, but the hand with which he grasped the brush trembled, so the man spread the paper on the ground for him. RQ bent down and as painstakingly as if his life depended on it, drew a circle. Afraid people would laugh at him, he determined to make the circle round. However, not only was that wretched brush very heavy, but it would not do his biting. Wobbling instead from side to side and just as the line was about to close, it swerved out again, making a shape like a melon seed. While RQ was ashamed because he had not been able to draw a round circle, that man had already taken back the paper and brush without any comment. And then a number of people dragged him back for the third time through the bar door. This time he did not feel particularly irritated. He supposed that in this world it was the fate of everybody at some time to be dragged in and out of prison and to have to draw circles on paper. It was only because his circle had not been round that he felt there was a blot on his escutcheon. Presently, however, he regained composure by thinking only idiots can make perfect circles and with this thought he fell asleep. That night, however, the successful provincial candidate was unable to go to sleep because he had quarreled with the captain. The successful provincial candidate has insisted that the most important thing was to recover the stolen goods, while the captain said the most important thing was to make a public example. Recently, the captain had come to treat the successful provincial candidate quite disdainfully. So, banging his fist on the table, he said, Punish one to all one hundred. See now, I have been a member of your revolutionary party for less than twenty days. But there have been a dozen cases of robbery. None of them solved yet. And think how badly that reflects on me. And now that one case had been solved, you come to argue like a pedant. It won't do. This is my affair. The successful provincial candidate had been very upset but had still persisted, saying that if the stolen goods were not recovered, he would resign immediately from the post as assistant civil administrator. As you please, said the captain. In consequence, the successful provincial candidate did not sleep that night, but happily, he did not hand in his resignation after all the next day. The third time that argue was dragged out of the bar door was the morning, following the night on which the successful provincial candidate had been unable to sleep. When he reached the big hall, the old man with the clean-shaved head was still sitting there as usual. And RQ also knelt down as usual. Very gently, the old man questioned him, Have you anything more to say? RQ thought and decided there was nothing to say, so he answered, Nothing. A number of men in long coats and short jackets put on him a white vest of foreign cloth, with some black characters on it. RQ felt considerably disconcerted because this was very like morning dress and to wear mourning was unlucky. At the same time, his hands were bound behind his back and he was dragged out of the Yemen. RQ was lifted onto an uncovered cart and several men in short jackets sat down with him. The cart started off at once. In front were a number of soldiers and military men shouldering foreign rifles, and on both sides were crowd of gaping spectators. While what was behind RQ could not see, but suddenly it occurred to him, Can I be going to have my head cut off? Panic seized him, and everything turned dark before his eyes, while there was a humming in his ears as if he had fainted, but he did not really faint. Although he felt frightened some of the time, the rest of the time he was quite calm. It seemed to him that in this world probably, it was the fate of everybody at some time to have his head cut off. He still recognized the road and felt rather surprised. 
Why were they not going to the execution ground? He did not know that he was being paraded round the street as a public example. But if he had known, it would have been the same. He would only have thought that in this world, probably, it was the fate of everybody at some time to be made a public example of. Then he realized that they were making a detour to the execution ground. So he must be going to have his head cut off, after all. He looked round him regretfully at the people swarming after him like ants. And unexpectedly in the crowd of people by the road he caught sight of Amavu. So that was why he had not seen her for so long. She had been working in town. RQ suddenly became ashamed of his lack of spirit because he had not sung any lines from an opera. His thoughts revolved like a whirlwind. The young widow at her husband's grave was not heroic enough. The words of I regret to have killed the battle of dragon and tiger were too poor. I'll thrash you with a steel mace was still the best. But when he wanted to raise his hands, he remembered that they were bound together, so he did not sing, I'll thrash you either. In twenty years, I shall be another. In his agitation, R.Q. uttered half a saying, which he had picked up himself, but never used before. The crowd's roar, good, sounded like the growl of a wolf. The cart moved steadily forward. During the shouting, Arcu's eye turned in search of Amavu. But she did not seem to have seen him, for she was looking raptly at the foreign rifles carried by the soldiers. So Arcu took another look at the shouting crowd. At that instant, his thoughts revolted again like a whirlwind. Four years before, at the foot of the mountain, he had met a hungry wolf which had followed him at a set distance, wanting to eat him. He had nearly died of fright, but luckily he happened to have an axe in his hand, which gave him the courage to get back to Wei Chung. But he had never forgotten that wolf's eyes, fierce yet cowardly, gleaming like two below the vest, as if boring into him from a distance. And now he saw eyes more terrible even than the wolf's, dull yet penetrating eyes that seemed to have devoured his words and to be still eager to devour something beyond his flesh and blood. And these eyes kept following him at a set distance. These eyes seemed to have merged in one, biting into his soul. Help, help. But Arkew never uttered these words. All had turned black before his eyes, there was a buzzing in his ears, and he felt as if his whole body were being scattered like so much light dust. As for the after effects of the robbery, the most affected was a successful provincial candidate. Because the stolen goods were never recovered, all his family lamented bitterly. Next came the Chow household, for when the successful country candidate went into town, to report the robbery, not only did he have his pigtail cut off by bad revolutionaries, but he had to pay a reward of 20,000 cash into the bargain. So all the Chow family too lamented bitterly. From that day forward, they gradually assumed the air of survivors of a fallen dynasty. As for any discussion of the event, no question was raised in Waichung. Naturally, all agreed that RQ had been a bad man. The proof that he had been shot. For if he had not been bad, how could he have been shot? But the census of opinion in town was unfavorable. Most people were dissatisfied because the shooting was not such a fine spectacle as a decapitation. And what a ridiculous culprit that had been too to have passed through so many streets without singing a single line from an opera. They had followed him for nothing. Chapter 4 The Tragedy of Love There are said to be some victors who take no pleasure in a victory 
unless their opponents are as fierce as tigers or eagles. If their adversaries are as timid as sheep or chickens, they find their triumph empty. There are other victors who, having carried all before them with the enemy, slain or surrendering and covering in utter subjection, realize that now they are left with no foe, rival or friend. They have only themselves, supreme, solitary, desolate and forlorn. And then they find their triumph a tragedy. But our hero was not so spineless. He was always exultant. This may be a proof of the moral supremacy of China over the rest of the world. Look at RQ, light and elated, as if about to fly. This victory was not without strange consequences, though. For quite a time he seemed to be flying, and he flew into the tutelary god's temple, where he would normally have snored as soon as he lay down. This evening, however, he found it very difficult to close his eyes, for he felt as if there was something the matter with his thumb and his finger, which seemed to be smoother than usual. It is impossible to say whether something soft and smooth on the little nun's face had stuck to his finger, or whether his finger had been rubbed smooth against her cheek. Argue, may you die sunless. These words sounded again in Argue's ears, and he thought, quite right, I should take a wife, for if a man dies sunless, he has no one to sacrifice a bowl of rice to his spirit. I ought to have a wife. As the saying goes, there are three forms of unfilial conduct, of which the worst is to have no descendants. And it is one of the tragedies of life that spirits without descendants go hungry. Thus, his view was absolutely in accordance with the teachings of saints and sages. And it is indeed a pity that later he should have run amok. Woman, woman, he thought. The monk pawns, woman, 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 he thought again. We shall never know when RQ finally fell asleep that evening. After this, however, he probably always found his fingers rather soft and smooth and always remained a little light-headed. Woman, he kept thinking. From this we can see that woman is a menace to mankind. The majority of Chinese men could become saints and sages were it not for the unfortunate fact that they are ruined by women. The Shang dynasty was destroyed by Ta Chi. The Chao dynasty was undermined by Pao Zhu. As for the Qin dynasty, although there is no historical evidence to that effect, yet if we assume that it fell on account of some women, we shall probably not be far wrong. And it is a fact that Thung Cho's death was caused by Tiao Chen. Aqiu too had been a man of strict morals to begin with, although we do not know whether he was guided by some good teacher. He had always shown himself most scrupulous in observing strict segregation of the sexes and was righteous enough to denounce such heretics as the little nun and the imitation foreign devil. His view was, all nuns must carry on in secret with monks. When a woman walks alone on the street, she must be wanting to seduce bad men. When a man and woman talk together, they must be arranging to meet. In order to correct such people, he would glare furiously, pass loud cutting remarks, or if the place was deserted, throw a small stone from behind. Who could tell that close on thirty, when a man should stand firm, he would lose his head like this over a little nun? Such light-headedness, according to the classical canons, is most reprehensible. Thus, women certainly are hateful creatures. 
For if the little nun's face had not been soft and smooth, Argue would not have been bewitched by her, nor would this have happened if the little nun's face had been covered by a cloth. Five or six years before, when watching an open-air opera, he had pinched the leg of a woman in the audience. But because it was separated from him by the cloth of her trousers, he had not had this light-headed feeling afterwards. The little nun had not covered her face. However, and this is another proof of the odiousness of the heretic. Woman, thought Arcue. He kept a close watch on those women who he believed must be wanting to seduce bad men. But they did not smile at him. He listened very carefully to those women who talked to him. But not one of them mentioned anything relevant to a secret rendezvous. Ah, this was simply another example of the odiousness of women. They all assumed a false modesty. One day when Ah was grinding rice in Mr. Chow's house, he sat down in the kitchen after supper to smoke a pipe. If it had been anyone else's house, he could have gone home after supper. But they dined early in the Chow family. Although it was the rule that you must not light a lamp but go to bed after eating, there were occasional exceptions to the rule. Before Mr. Chow's son passed the country examination, he was allowed to light a lamp to study the examination essays. And when Ah came to do odd jobs, he was allowed to light a lamp to grind rice. Because of this latter exception to the rule, Ah was still sitting in the kitchen, smoking before going on with his work. When Ama Wu, the only maid servant in the Chow household, had finished washing the dishes, she sat down too on the long bench and started chatting to Ah Our mistress hasn't eaten anything for two days because the master wants to get a concubine. Woman, Ama Wu, this little widow, thought Ah Our young mistress is going to have a baby in the eighth, ma- eighth moon. Woman, thought Ah He put down his pipe and stood up. Our young mistress, Ama Wu, chattered on. Sleep with me. Ah suddenly rushed forward and threw himself at her feet. There was a moment of absolute silence. Ayya! Dumbfounded for an instant, Ama Wu suddenly began to tremble, then rushed out shaking and could soon be heard sobbing. Ah kneeling opposite the wall, was dumbfounded too. He grasped the empty bench with both hands and stood up slowly, dimly aware that something was wrong. In fact, by this time, he was in rather a very nervous state himself. In a fury, he struck his pipe into his belt and decided to go back to the rise. But bang! A heavy blow landed on his head, and he spun round to see the successful county candidate standing standing before him, brandishing a big bamboo pole. How dare you! The big bamboo pole came down across Arcu's shoulders, and when he put up both hands to protect his head, the blow landed on his knuckles, causing him considerable pain. As he was escaping through the kitchen door, it seemed as if his back also received a blow. Turtle's egg shouted the successful candidate, cursing him in Mandarin from behind. Ah fled to the hulling floor where he stood alone, still feeling a pain in his knuckles and still remembering that turtle's egg because it was an expression never used by the Wei Chung villagers, but only by the rich who had seen something of official life. This had made him more frightened and left an exceptionally deep impression on his mind. By now, however, all thought of women had flown. After this cursing and beating, it seemed as if something was done with. 
and he began quite light-heartedly to grind rice again. After grinding for a time, he grew hot and stopped to take off his shirt. While he was taking off his shirt, he heard an uproar outside. And since RQ always liked to join in any excitement that was going, he went out in search of the sound. He traced it gradually right into Mr. Chow's inner courtyard. Although it was dusk, he could see many people there. All the Chow family, including the mistress, who had not eaten for two days. In addition, there was their neighbor, Mrs. Tsao, as well as their relatives, Chao Pai Yan and Chao Zhu Chan. The young mistress was leading Ama Wu out of the servants' quarter, saying as she did so, Come outside, don't stay brooding in your own room. Everybody knows you are a good woman, put in Mr. Su from the side. You must not think of committing suicide. Ama Wu merely wailed, muttering something inaudible. This is interesting, thought Ah Kyu. What mischief can this little widow be up to? Wanting to find out, he was approaching Chao Shu Chan, when suddenly he caught sight of Mr. Chao's eldest son rushing towards him with what was more, the big bamboo pole in his hand. The sight of this big bamboo pole reminded him that he had been beaten by it. And he realized that apparently he was connected in some way with this scene of excitement. He turned and ran, hoping to escape to the hulling floor, not foreseeing that the bamboo pole would cut off his retreat. Thereupon he turned and ran in the other direction leaving without further ado by the back door. In a short time, he was back in the turtley god's temple. After Argue had sat down for a time, his skin began to form goose pimples and he felt cold because although it was spring, the nights were still quite frosty and not suited to bare backs. He remembered that he had left his shirt in the chow house, but he was afraid if he went to fetch it, he might get another taste of the successful candidate's bamboo pole. Then the bailiff came in. Curse you, Aq, said the bailiff. So you can't even keep your hands off the chow family servants, you rebel. You have made me lose my sleep, curse you. Under this torrent of abuse, Aq naturally had nothing to say. Finally, since it was night time, Aq had to pay double and give the bailiff 400 cash. But because he happened to have no ready money by him, he gave his felt hat as security and agreed to the following five terms. 1. The next morning, Aq must take a pair of red candles weighing one pound and a bundle of incense sticks to the Chao family to atone for his misdeeds. 2. Aq must pay for the Taoist priest whom the Chao family had called to exorcise evil spirits. 3. Aq must never again set foot in the Chao household. 4. If anything unfortunate should happen to Ama Wu, Aq must be held responsible. 5. Aq must not go back for his wages or shirt. Aq naturally agreed to everything, but unfortunately he had no ready money. Luckily, it was already spring, so it was possible to do without his padded quilt, which he pawned for 2,000 cash to comply with the terms stipulated. After kowtowing with the bare back, he still had a few cash left. But instead of using these to redeem his felt hat from the bailiff, he spent them all on drink. Actually, the Chao family burnt neither the incense nor the candles, because these could be used when the mistress worshipped Buddha and were put aside for that purpose. 
Most of the ragged shirt was made into diaper for the baby, which was born to the young mistress in the eighth moon, while the tattered remainder was used by Amavu to make shoe soles. Chapter 5 The Problem of Livelihood After Akyu had kowtowed and complied with the Chao family terms, he went back as usual to the tutelary god's temple. The sun had gone down and he began to feel that something was wrong. Careful thought led him to the conclusion that this was probably because his back was bare. Remembering that he still had a ragged line jacket, he put it on and lay down. And when he opened his eyes again, the sun was already shining on the top of the west wall. He sat up, saying, Curse it. After getting up, he loafed about the streets as usual, until he began to feel that something else was wrong. Though this was not to be compared to the physical discomfort of a bare back, apparently from that day onwards, all the women in Weichung became shy of RQ. Whenever they saw him coming, they would take refuge indoors. In fact, even Mrs. So, who was nearly 50 years old, retreated in confusion with the rest, calling her 11-year-old daughter to go inside. This struck RQ as very strange, the bitches, he thought. They have suddenly become as coy as young ladies. A good many days later, however, he felt even more strongly that something was wrong. First, the wine shop refused him credit. Secondly, the old man in charge of the tutelary god's temple made some uncalled for remarks, as if he wanted Akyu to leave. And thirdly, for many days, how many exactly he could not remember, not a soul had come to hire him. To be refused credit in the wine shop he could put up with, if the old man kept urging him to leave, Akyu could just ignore his complaints. But when no one came to hire him, he had to go hungry. And this was really a cursed say to be in. When Akyu could stand it no longer, he went to his regular employer's houses to find out what was matter. It was only Mr. Chao's threshold that he was not allowed to cross. But he met with a very strange reception. The one to appear was always a man who looked thoroughly annoyed and waved Akyu away as if he were a beggar, saying, There is nothing, nothing at all, go away. Akyu find it more and more extraordinary. These people always needed help in the past, he thought. They can't suddenly have nothing to be done. This looks fishy. And after making careful inquiries, he found out that when they had any odd jobs, they all called in Young D on. Now this young D was a lean and weakly pauper, even lower in Akyu's eyes than Whiskers Wang. Who could have thought that this low fellow would steal his living from him? So this time Akyu's indignation was greater than usual, and going on his way fuming, he suddenly raised his arm and sang, I'll thrash you with a steel mace. A few days later, he did indeed meet Young Di in front of Mr. Chien's house. When two foes met, their eyes flare, flash fire. As Akyu went up to him, Young Di stood still. Stupid ass, hissed Akyu, glaring furiously and foaming at the mouth. I am an insect, will that do? asked Young Di. Such modesty only made Akyu angrier than ever. But since he had no, real, no steel mace in his hand, all he could do was to rush forward with outstretched hand to seize Young Di's pigtail. Young Di, protecting his pigtail with one hand, with the other tried to seize Akyu's. Whereupon Akyu also used one free hand to protect his own pigtail. In the past, Akyu had never considered Young Di worth taking seriously. But since he had recently shifted, suffered from hunger himself, he was now as thin and weakly as his opponent. So that 
they presented a spectacle of evenly matched antagonists. Four hands clutched at two hands, both men bending at the waist, casting a blue, rainbow-shaped shadow on the Chian family's white wall for over half an hour. All right, all right, exclaimed some of the onlookers, probably trying to make peace. Good, good, exclaimed others, but whether to make peace, applaud the fighters or incite them onto further efforts is not certain. The two combatants turned deaf ears to them all. However, if RQ advanced three paces, Young D would recoil three paces, and so they would stand. Wei Chung had few striking clocks, so it is difficult to tell the time. It may have been 20 minutes when steam was rising from both their heads, perspiration pouring down their cheeks. RQ let fall his hands and in the same second, Young D's hand swelled too. They straightened up simultaneously and stepped back simultaneously, pushing their way out through the crowd. You'll be hearing from me again, curse you, said RQ over his shoulders. Curse you, you'll be hearing from me again echoed young D also over his shoulder. The sepic struggle had apparently ended neither in victory nor defeat, and it is not known whether the spectators were satisfied or not, for none of them expressed any opinion, but still not a soul came to her argue. One warm day when a balmy breeze seemed to give some forecasts of summer, argue actually began to feel cold, but he could put up with this. His greatest worry was an empty stomach. His cotton quilt, felt hat and shirt had disappeared long ago. And after that, he had sold his padded jacket. Now, nothing was left but his trousers and these, of course, he could not take off. He had a ragged line jacket, it is true. But this was certainly worthless unless he gave it away to be made into shoe soles. He had long been hoping to pick up a sum of money on the road, but hitherto he had not been successful. He had also hoped he might suddenly discover a sum of money in his tumble-down room and had looked wildly all around it, but the room was quite, quite empty. Thereupon he made up his mind to go out in search of food. As if he was, talking, he was walking along the road, in search of food he saw the familiar wine shop and the familiar steamed bread. But he passed them by without pausing for a second, without even hankering after them. It was not these he was looking for, although what exactly he was looking for, he did not know himself. Wai Chung was not a big place and soon he had left it behind. Most of the country outside the village consisted of paddy fields, green as far as the eye could see with the tender shoots of young rice, dotted here and there with round black moving objects which were peasants cultivating the fields. But blinds to the delight of country life, RQ simply went to the way, for he knew instinctively that this was far removed from his search of food. Finally, however, he came to the walls of the convent of quiet self-improvement. The convent too was surrounded by paddy fields, its white walls standing out sharply in the fresh green and inside the low earthen wall at the back was a vegetable garden. RQ hesitated for a time looking around him. Since there was no one in sight, he scrambled onto the low wall, hold on, holding on to some milk worth. The mud wall started crumbling and RQ shook with fear. However, by clutching at the branch of a mulberry tree, he managed to jump inside. Within was a wild profusion of vegetation, but no sign of yellow wine. Steamed bread or anything edible. By the west wall was a clump of bamboos. With many bamboo shoots, but unfortunately these were not cooked. There was also wrap, which had long since gone to seed. The mustard was already about to flower and the small cabbage looked very tough. RQ felt as resentful as a scholar who had failed in the examination 
and was walking slowly towards the gate of the garden when he gave a start for joy. For there before him what should he see but a patch of turnips as he knelt down and began picking a round head suddenly appeared from behind the gate only to be withdrawn again at once and this was no other than the little nun. Now though R.Q. had always had the greatest contempt for such people as little nuns there are times when discretion is the better part of valor. He hastily pulled up four turnips, tore off the leaves and folded them in his jacket. By a time, by this time, an old nun had already come out. May Buddha preserve us, Aku. What made you climb into our garden to steal turnips? Oh dear, what a wicked thing to do. Oh dear, Buddha preserve us. When did I ever climb into your garden and steal turnips? retorted R.Q., looking at her as he started off. Now, aren't you? said the old nun, pointing at the folds of his jacket. Are these yours? Can you make them answer you? You? Leaving his sentence unfinished, R.Q. took to his heels as fast as he could, followed by an enormously fat black dog. This dog had originally been at the front gate and it was a mystery how it had reached the back garden. The black dog gave chase, snarling, and was just about to bite R.Q.'s leg when a turnip fell most opportunately from the latter jacket. And the dog, taken by surprise, surprise stopped for a second. During this time, R.Q. scrambled up the mulberry tree scaled the mud wall and fell, turnips and all, outside the convent. He left the black dog still barking by the mulberry tree and the old nun saying her prayers. Fearing that the nun would let the black dog out again, R.Q. gathered together his turnips and ran, picking up a few small stones as he went, but the black dog did not reappear. R.Q. threw away the stones and walked on, eating as he went, thinking to himself, There is nothing to be had here. I had better to go to town. By the time he had finished the third turnip, he had made up his mind to go to town.